Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me out there. The tornado siren testing tells me it is noon, so it's time to get started. Welcome to the February 2021 Legacies and Lunch, a program of the Cowles Butler Center for Arkansas Studies. I'm Heather Register Zabinden, Outreach Coordinator for the Roberts Library. Um, and in the Roberts Library, we have the galleries at Library Square, the Butler Center for Arkansas Studies, and the Encyclopedia of Arkansas. The galleries at Library Square and the bookstore at Library Square have merged into one fantastic galleries at Library Square located in the Roberts Library. They are open Wednesday through Friday, 10 until 5, and Saturday from 12 until 5. So come check out the new incarnation of this wonderful retail space. The Roberts Library Research Room is open Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 10 until 5. You'll need to call ahead to make an appointment and request your materials at least two business days in advance. Go to robertslibrary.org for all the specifics before planning your visit. And I want to put in a plug for the Encyclopedia of Arkansas and some programming we've been doing. Um, don't miss the Encyclopedia of Arkansas's Rage, Race, and Resistance series on Monday evenings in February. They're at 6.30 on Zoom, and you can register at robertslibrary.org or cals.org. You can also find more information about our Black History Month programming um, by going to cows.org. It's on the main screen and you can find out about the uh, video series that the theater is doing virtually and all the other programming available. The speaker will answer questions at the end of the session, so you can type your questions in the chat box on Zoom. We won't be using the Q&A fe feature, so make sure to put them in chat. And now for today's program. Um, I have to admit, I am really excited about this program because I think it's so important and it's so timely. Today we have Eric Hughes talking about the construction of Interstate 630 in Little Rock and how it intentionally resegregated the city. Um, I remember most of the construction of the interstate, the, especially the main parts um, in the 70s and 80s. Um, and I just, I think it's such an important topic for us to discuss here today as part of Legacies and Lunch. Eric Cues is an educator, entrepreneur, artist, and, ph and philanthropist. He holds a BA in history with a concentration in African and African American studies and an MA in history. He is currently a PhD candidate in, his, in the Department of History at the University of Arkansas Fayetteville. Hughes's research examines modern environmental segregation in the 20th century, in 20th century urban America. Hughes is the founder of Visionary Enterprises which produces media and events with a mission to promote and preserve Black culture. So I want everybody to give a warm welcome to Eric Hughes. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Thank you all for, for inviting me uh, to join today. Uh, I'm excited about the opportunity to um, talk about this topic and um, to really continue uh, this research project. Um, this is a research project that I'm undertaking for my dissertation. And so um, I'm thankful for the opportunity to share that with you all today. Um, as Heather uh, kindly stated, my name is Eric Hughes. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. And I'm also an adjunct professor at the at Philander Smith College um, teaching Arkansas history. And today I want to read a selection from my upcoming dissertation project, a research project, Through the Heart of the City, Interstates, Segregation, and Memory in Urban America. So I will just go ahead and start. I do have some visuals. So let me see if um, I want to put this one background up. Um, actually, I think I can share multiple ones. So. I'm just gonna share these. All right. James Baldwin showed us that 
History does not refer merely to the past, but it is literally present in all we do. This truth reverberates throughout the modern history of Arkansas's capital. My project explores the impact of 20th century urban planning and, rede and development practices, which reshaped urban landscapes and resegregated cities across America. Interstate 630 is Little Rock's felt history, a history lived in the city's imagination. In Little Rock, this infrastructural development serves as a primary barrier between class and racial demographics. Wilbur, Wilbur's Wall is a fitting nickname for the freeway, and the grievous ramifications of its construction have long been understood. I-630 is synchronized in the minds of Central Arkansans, consciously and subconsciously guiding factors, including where it's safest to live, where the best opportunities to provide for a family are located, and how residents reflect status and daily proximity to black and brown people. Physically and psychologically, Interstate 630's construction concluded the work began during urban renewal relocation projects, destroying what remained of many traditionally Black Little Rock communities. It is important to note that the intentional segregation seen in cities like Little Rock is not solely caused by or due to freeway construction. However, it is also evidently clear that private business and social interest groups wielded significant influence in transforming the capital city to support multiple aims of white supremacy. In addition to securing more racial homogeneity, another possible tacit aim was to improve the city's reputation from a turbulent, turbulent legacy of racial conflict. On September 3rd, 1957, Ms. Bertie Eckford asked Ms. Daisy Bates a question of tremendous historical significance. Ms. Eckford, mother of one, of one of the nine children set to enforce the United States Supreme Court mandate to desegregate desegregate public schools in Little Rock, Arkansas, asked Ms. Bates if she could keep her daughter Elizabeth safe through the unimaginable difficulty of the monumental task. Ms. Eckford expounded on the basis of her fears, revealing that as a child in 1927, she and her mother experienced the brutal lynching of John Carter firsthand. Carter's murder was cemented in the mind of Ms. Eckford and countless others at the time due to the heinous and barbaric parade display of Carter's body. The explosive editorial headlines that ran across hundreds of newspapers covering the lynching like you see here. And the fact that this lynching occurred during the most tumultuous flooding ever recorded in Arkansas. Carter's lynching was one of numerous documented and undocumented incidents of racial violence that was seared into the memory of many black and white Arkansans, even 30 years later in 1957. Obviously, technological advances allowed far greater documentation of the frenzied mobs that resisted Central High School's desegregation in 1957 than the mobs that murdered John Carter in 1927. Nonetheless, today, most references and recollections of racial controversy in Arkansas's capital point primarily to the desegregation crisis at Central High School. While the years 1919, 1927, and 1957 are pivotal in the memory of many Arkansans for their connection to racial violence, as we approach the quarter mark of the 20th century, this remembrance has organically blurred in some areas and intentionally been erased in others. John Carter's 1927 lynching and the 1957 desegregation crisis at Central High School were embarrassments to the capital city, especially considering how these incidents complicated local and national business interests. The 1950s saw, new, saw many new realities for American cities in addition to increasingly desegregated public landscapes including the challenges of exponential urban growth, which was a paramount concern for local city planners. Little Rock's approach to these problems presented a unique opportunity to both address the needs of a rapidly growing urban population, as well as a chance to reconstruct a more racially equitable image of progress detached from a, from a violent past. Examining Little Rock's modern history through the lens of urban renewal revealed that public reports and marketing were used to tout the positive benefits of infrastructural developments, such as Little Rock's new substandard housing units and in Interstate 630. These strategic media also emphasized the preservation of certain aspects of Little Rock history, noticeably omitting records of racial turmoil. Today, there is a healthy community remembrance of Central High School's desegregation. Yet beyond a few invaluable chronicles offered by local historians, um, Memory of Carter's lynching has largely been buried under the freeway concrete. After years of theoretical foundation and surveying analysis, Little Rock's solution to his urban growing pains were realized the longstanding visions of early 20th century planner John Nolan, 
by completing the construction of an east-west connector route between U.S. Interstate 30 in the east of the city and U.S. Interstate 430 in the western outskirts. The manifestation of this vision was coordinated by local, state, and federal governments, leading civic planners and philanthropists. U.S. Congressman Wilbur Mills was among the most prominent individual proponents for the completion of I-630. Wills was a Harvard-educated native of Kensett, Arkansas, who became the chair of the U.S. House Committee on Ways and Means, earning the title the most powerful man in Washington. Mills was engaged to bring Little Rock's fledgling East-West Expressway project into the federal interstate program by local economic interests, including longtime civic leader George Miller, recruited specifically to lobby for Mills' support. Using Mills' influence, city leaders sought to create a new brand for the capital, a fresh legacy distanced from the fraught history of racial violence. Planning and environmental impact statement documents for Interstate 630 espouse the coolly orchestrated qualities of the urban renewal language and objectives, including the desire for economic advancement through slum eradication and greater accessibility between locations in the central core and growing outskirts. Little Rock's urban development model was consistent with redeveloping cities around the country during the mid 20th century, where sprawling new interstate roadway projects remade formerly longstanding communities and was cautiously redirected away from others. In the decades following the 1950s, the new generation of the new generations of freeway scholars gave voice to this contentious national freeway revolt movement, chronicling the arguments and passionate resistance to interstate construction that occurred in many cities on a variety of positions. Their analysis offered perspectives ranging from evaluations of the interstate system as an unfulfilled promise to interpretations of the interstate system as manifest destiny, modern manifest destiny. Consistent themes rose from these early critiques including the use of urban growth forecasting and calculation models to justify clearly discriminatory route selections, which overwhelmingly displaced poor black urbanites, the community recognition of freeway projects, tendencies to resegregate urban spaces, mixed responses from affected communities with sides taken both for and against construction, and the coordination of power systems that united to implement freeway programs in many urban locations with varying levels of success. Little Rock aligned with these national planning strategies through the persistence of route selections for the phased construction of I-630. One especially controversial eastern section of I-630 was planned and constructed, and constructed through the heart of Little Rock's majority Black 9th Street community, known as the Line. The Line was formerly the economic heartbeat of Black Little Rock and was the setting for the savage spectacle lynching of John Carter in 1927. Freeway historians have long established the links between intentional route placements like I-630's eastern section and the desire to rid city spaces of blight and urban decay. The language of urban renewal was consistently used to relegate poor Black urbanites into statistical data that stymied economic growth and required a solution of eminent domain. Decades later, when members from these affected and displaced areas spoke out against the understood harm I-630 posed to their communities, they were joining a freeway revolt occurring in cities across the nation where federal interstate projects were constructed. Parallels between the execution of I-630 and other federal interstate projects in cities, including New York, Boston, Chicago, Los Angeles, Atlanta, New Orleans, Miami, and even Africatown, Alabama, demonstrated consistent objectives and similar ramifications. I approached the, pro the problem of Little Rock overwhelmingly whitewashed social legacy and segregated reality by returning to Interstate 630, not to redrawn past blistering, but to recontextualize the freeway's presence and impact on our current understandings. Interstate roadways are obviously an exceptionally huge phenomenon. These pieces of technology revolutionized the nation in many lasting ways. The over 48,000 miles of national uh, the over 48,000 mile national system of interstate and defense highways is behemoth in both is behemoth in sheer size, capacity, and among the largest public works projects ever constructed. An increasingly discussed aspect of American freeways are the psychological impact beyond their imposing and intrusive physical dimensions. At the dawn of the 20th century, American communities won and lost battles. At the dawn of the 21st century, American communities won and lost battles against the expanding national interstate system. 
but enough time had passed for deeper context as to how fundamentally urban life transformed during the freeway age. Early conventional narratives reported on the freeway construction and revolt eras, thoroughly chronicling a spectrum of views concerning this urban political struggle. Fresh insights have reframed the experiences of impacted residents beyond the taglines of progress and the imagery of poor black slum families relocating to standardized housing facilities that filled the urban renewal propaganda in numerous cities. Deep-seated beliefs that post-war post highway construction was a state-sanctioned assault on minority urban communities have eloquently been affirmed in a generation since the freeway scholars' early critiques. Urban communities around America responded to this assault by developing distinct cultures that are in direct relationship with the freeway structures. These broadly defined cultural expressions include, but are not limited to, art, literature, photography, graffiti, murals, theaters, oral history, poetry, sculpture, and film, and all reflect intimate knowledge of the freeway structure itself and its greater um, impression on urban communities. Freeway culture remains a plausible reification of community responses to traumatic and, inner, and innervating impositions as eminent domain and highway construction. Local, state, and federal governments undeniably used urban renewal and highway construction specifically to execute the agendas of their moneyed interests, which ultimately exacerbated many of the crisis urban renewal policies were designed to solve. Official summarizing reports such as the city, uh, the Little Rock City Housing Authority's 1950 publication, Little Rock Substandard Housing, feature imagery of poor black families relocating to standardized homes and communities, as well as racialized socioeconomic demographic statistics. Efforts to fix urban blight began in 1951 when, when the Little Rock Housing Authority cleared large sections of the Dunbar neighborhood, the first of multiple historically Af African-American communities sacrificed in the name of urban progress. Relocations also occurred in Philander Smith, Granite Mountain, and West Rock communities, among others. Many of the impacted individuals and families were relocated to newly constructed standardized homes in designated areas or to public housing facilities. Relocation efforts were administered through field office strategically placed in targeted communities to facilitate this transition process. Displaced individuals and families were provided access to government aid to help with relocation However, resources were limited and usually inadequate to support long-term security for new placements. The city's efforts to clear and repurpose large sections of private homes were not hidden, but touted through the language of economic improvement and promulgated through the distribution of mass publications. Published relocation studies for each of the impacted communities juxtaposed before and after, after images um, with, more, with more demographic statistics verifying the benefits of urban renewal to inner city Little Rock, including statistical indicators for race, family compensation, income and economic projectors, education, juvenile and adult crime rates, and even health factors like sexually transmitted disease rates. A 1965 publication by the Urban Progress Association declared Little Rock's goal to be, quote, the first capital city without slums, end quote. And this was one of over 35,000 pieces of literature published by the Urban Progress Association alone. Leading civic philanthropist Raymond Resmond de described these changes in Little Rock's social landscape. He affirmed, quote, change is inevitable, is inevitable. We must anticipate and plan for it with every tool of knowledge and experience we have available to us. We must equip ourselves to become the managers of change or most assuredly we will become victims of it, end quote. Resmond himself was no novice to urban renewal in Little Rock. In fact, he was celebrated by Senator J. William Fulbright um, in April of 1965 as the public spirited man who made urban renewal work in Arkansas. So Interstate 630's history was well documented um, by government, by governing and public interest. The August 1966 issue of Scene Magazine aptly promoted how the capital city would uh, rehabilitate, rehabilitate this reputation from a legacy of racial strife. This publication which selectively captured Little Rock's history and photos, vowed that the progress of urban renewal would not come at the expense of the proud heritage of the Southern city. George Miller, the housing authority president and key lobbying, key lobbyist for Congressman Mills was quoted in this publication saying, there are no easy problems to solve in urban renewal. Um, Many were inconvenienced, 
a few were hurt, but end quote, but through this understanding and through these relocations, a new Southern model for urban renewal had now emerged. Interestingly, the city's historical narrative given in this piece skipped completely over most of the 20th century from 1912 to 1970, while, pro while promising urban renewal would actually save Little Rock history. Key historic locations like Albert Pike Settler Home were preserved, but an Urban Progress Association spokesman was also quoted in this same publication as saying, quote, the question we face today is whether our fine new freeway and expressway systems are to be a quick and efficient method of getting to downtown or through downtown, end quote. The freeway culture developments in Little Rock revealed how federal interstate projects like I-630 targeted and psychologically impacted communities. However, Little Rock may present a new metaphysical functionality for I-630, potentially also rele relevant in other locations where interstates were built. I-630's construction is among the largest uh, reasons why Little Rock's business and social reputation rebounded despite such a hellacious record of racial hostility. Arkansas's capital need to re needed to revamp its public image and accomplish this goal by burying its past under the concrete of I-630. What if Wilbur, what if Wilbur Mills Freeway serves as a social neuralizer, akin to the technological device used by the agents and men in black to reset the memory of Little Rock's past, set, past transgressions? While fanciful, this explanation gives greater meaning to the insidious nature and consequences of freeway development. These behemoth interstate structures function as technological devices in the fullest capacity, enabling the mobility of people in commerce while simultaneously shifting and confining certain demographics of Little Rock society into predetermined locations. In Little Rock, Interstate 630 also remolded the city's reputation and transformed memories from a dark past towards a new future. Brighter economic futures may have been the publicly stated goal for modern urban redevelopment projects in Little Rock, but the embodiment of Southern conservative resistance to racial integration was a lasting legacy of I-630. Manifesting the modern urban form through federal interstates was a result of measured planning and focused execution. New cities emerged from the neighborhood and demographic analysis reports that determined greater mobility and economic access for some was best for the public good, despite the displacement of many thousands of poor urbanites. The national system of interstate and defense highways was utilized to maintain white supremacy as American cities transformed into the racialized urban landscapes we recognize today. Racial segregation, de jure and de facto, has irrefutably been a goal and tool of American power since conceptions of a national constitution were debated at the, Philadelphia, at the Pennsylvania State House and put to paper in 1787. Economist Gunnar, Gunnar Myrtle expounded on this perspective, contending, quote, patterns of segregation developed as part of the social heritage of Americans, end quote. Sharp increases in spectacle lynchings like John Carter's and racial violence during and following the redemption era were tools to enforce the Jim Crow social order. As city planners grappled with swelling urban populations um, in the early 21st century, in the early 20th century, Long-standing African-American communities were overwhelmingly targeted for redevelopment during urban renewal, with most relocations in Little Rock um, confined to strategically racialized zones. The route selections for I-630 intentionally cut through downtown Little Rock's well-established neighborhoods like the Quapaw Quarter and business districts like the Line. Um, preliminary mapping for the expressway included plans to save key city historical landmarks and institutions uh, including Mount Holly Cemetery, Arkansas Children's Hospital, the Arkansas State Capitol, Philander Smith College, and, and MacArthur Park from demolition. But thriving businesses and homes of many middle to low income, mostly black communities, lay squarely in the route selection for the new highway. Land acquisition for much of the inner city residential and commercial space necessary for I-630 was acquired between 1950 and 1966 during the height of Little Rock's urban renewal program. The Federal Housing Act of 1949 allocated $1 billion in federal assistance to local governments for clearing and redeveloping slum or blighted areas. Standardized housing was an emphasis of the 1949 Housing Act as legislation established goals for, quote, a decent home and suitable living environment for every American family, end quote. This goal was similarly expressed in Little Rock, and by the late, by the late 1960s, 
an estimated 2,651 families have been displaced by urban renewal projects in Little Rock, 53% of which were families of color. Academic studies like Gordon Wittenberg's 1966 American Institute of Architects publication, The Politics of Urban Design, validated desires to reshape modern Little Rock for economic improvement. Quote, as studies of the urban area progressed, it became apparent that we had an urban body with a sick heart. Our new growth areas would never reach their fullest potential until something was done to improve the heart itself, the control center. It was concluded that the best means available to attack the problems of blight and decay within the city was a massive citywide attack on the deficiencies of the past, end quote. Rebranding the city's black communities as urban decay and blight was indicative of racialized justifications prevalent throughout urban renewal. Forecasters of city demographics argued that Interstate 630 will remain a potent mental and physical demarcation for the social composition of Arkansas's capital. Consequently, the interstate supported relocation of large, number of large numbers of Little Rock's white residents to the west of the city. And many argue these re relocations are specifically detrimental to minority communities in Little Rock, limiting access to resources for a better livelihood. Political scientist Dr. Jay Barth contended Little Rock itself became a city of vigorous racial and class separation with the development of Interstate 630 through the heart of the city, a key factor for this segregation. Recent publications affirm that in cities across America, black and brown populations were essentially locked into urban ghettos with new freeway projects simultaneously serving as both channels of access and chains of confinement. Statistical data accessed through the Opportunity Atlas Project and the Trace.org Atlas of Gun Violence in America confirmed this confinement of suffering in Little Rock. Maps reflect I-630 as the fence by which lower income and employment rates, higher, in, higher incarceration, single parent and poverty rates, and increased gun violence are all contained. They also reflect the segregated reality of modern Little Rock, with most of the city's black and brown populations living south of I-630. In, intersectional assessment of freeway and segregation studies demonstrated how the goals of white supremacy evolved to match the capacity of the modern state. Social anxieties in the decades following the freeway generations expressly connected America's destiny to questions of race and urbanization. Public disillusionment during the 1960s transitioned into the reemergence of conservatism in the 1970s, and a change in executive administration solidified the need for state intervention to eradicate urban blight. In 1970, Advisor Daniel P. Moynihan proposed a, quote, memorandum for the president on the position of Negroes, end quote, to the newly inaugurated President Richard Nixon, offering, quote, the Negro lower classes must be dissolved by transforming it into a stable working class population. It is the low income, marginally employed, poorly educated, disorganized slum dwellers whom black extremists use to threaten white society with the prospects of mass arson and pillage, end quote. This memo presented the urban race problem as a paramount issue for the newly elected Nixon administration, which oversaw the expansion of the 1956 national system of interstate and defense highways through the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1970. Interstate 630 exhibited co a consistent approach by, co by coalitions of engineers, city planners, and government oversight to reconstitute Little Rock's urban spaces to maintain white supremacy using Interstate 630. This position builds upon historiographical contributions from Nate Connolly, whose work, a work, whose work, a world more concrete, elaborated on similar urban development processes that reshaped South Florida in the interest of wealthy white real estate power. Throughout this research project, historians and city administrators that I've been honored to speak with further confirmed the coalition of economic and legislative power required for such an enormous undertaking as Interstate 630. Urban policy scholars have thoroughly treated these phenomena, including white flight, in many works, including William Julius Wilson's classic, The Truly Disadvantaged, um, Kevin Cruz's White Flight, and Erica Villa's uh, Modern Freeway Studies, the, folk the Folklore of the Freeway, and Popular Culture in the Age of White Flight, which greatly expanded insights into the cultural impact interstate freeway projects made in cities across America. After World War II, white liberals and conservatives alike struggled with integrating minorities into the American experiment. 
and the National System of Interstate and Defense Highways proved an opportunistic path to forestall and control the growing diversity in urban spaces. I-630 is a case study for the goals and processes of state sanctioned urban redevelopment that allowed Little Rock to omit a heinous and embarrassing city history while restricting the onset of truly integrated communities. So I'm gonna conclude with talking about a few of my primary sources. Um, this research is certainly incomplete and definitely imperfect. However, a debt of gratitude is owed to all who have worked to chronicle what we know of Little Rock's modern urban history. Investigators and scholars have provided thorough explanations and explora thorough explorations into the phases of, con of construction and the consequences of IC30's development. So I won't belabor um, with going through those phases here. David Kuhn published an outstanding article in 2011 entitled Wilbert's Wall, chronicling I-630's fraught construction and historical implications. Um, Darcy Atwood uh, Pumphrey did the same in her 2013 master's thesis and in Interstate Runs Through It, the construction of Little Rock's Interstate 630 and the fight to stop it. Dr. John Kirk wonderfully contextualized Little Rock's resegregation in his publication, The Roots of Little Rock's Segregated Neighborhoods. And Citizen Perceptions of Little Rock City Government was a 2015 study published by the University of Arkansas Clinton School of Public Service that gave per firsthand perceptions of the capital city's government from those impacted by the expressway's production and Little Rock's resegregation. The Butler Center for Arkansas Studies published a very informative geographical map study, uh, Mapping Race and Politics in Central Arkansas, um, that provided visual representation to the continued impact of Little Rock's resegregation following 1957 and Central High School's desegregation. We know of the once vibrant black communities in Little Rock's in Little Rock, like the like West 9th Street or the Nine, the line from vital contributions by Bernard J. Love and Shanika Smith. Thankfully, we have the brilliant contributions of Daisy and Elsie Bates and current uh, dynamic work of Stephanie Harp, Guy Lancaster, um, Kwame Abdul Bay, and others to chronicle Little Rock's history of racial violence and keep that squarely in focus. Many thanks as well are given to Dr. Brian Mitchell, City Manager Bruce Moore, Mayor Frank Scott, and Mr. Wade Rathke, um, one of the founding organizers for ACORN, um, for lending invaluable insights to the nature and impact of urban renewal and freeway construction in Little Rock. One of the most important sources in this study is the final environmental impact statement report um, provided which provided an official state and federal narrative to understand the freeway's development. Numerous newspaper articles from the Arkansas Gazette chronicled public debates over I-630's construction. Similarly, this environmental impact statement included community opposition to constructing I-630 with more explanations given to dismiss concerns, with explanations given to dismiss concerns. John Vogler's public comments on hearing on an, John Vogler's public, public comments at a hearing on I-630 on June 2nd, 1977, indicated how intimately Little Rock citizens understood the ramifications of the freeway's construction. A resident of 9th Street for over 25 years, Mr. Vogler remarked, quote, I must warn you that there's not much left of the east side now. First, Interstate 630 sliced off Hangar Hill. Now the Mills Freeway threatens to isolate MacArthur Park from the, rest of down, from the rest of the downtown residential area. A freeway is a psychological barrier. There is not one single mention of the possibility that the Mills Freeway may encourage residential segregation in Little Rock. The completed segment is already well on its way to becoming a racial boundary, end quote. Official responses to Mr. Vogler's critique further exemplify the dismissive nature of Interstate 630 representatives by responding, quote, no data has been produced to date, which indicates that I-630 would create or encourage residential segregation. The relocation program is also carried out without racial bias, end quote. People are moved from all types of neighborhoods and relocated into neighborhoods. Um, oh, I'm sorry, not end quote. People are moved from all types of neighborhoods and are relocated into neighborhoods that contain available housing, which meets necessary criteria. Traditional boundaries should be altered very little and a freeway cannot create or erase any racial bias which may exist in society, end quote. This blatant disregard for the existing racialized statistics in urban relocation reports 
and the cavalier nature by which Mr. Vogler's comments were summarily rejected demonstrated a persistence by which local, city, state, and federal powers um, maintained their chosen construction plans despite open appeals to revisit development strategies. This persistence was key to understanding important insights regarding the unwritten objectives of I-630. And ultimately, my research project connects national post-war urban redevelopment experiences and the evolution of white supremacist strategy in America. Thank you. Thank you. Um, like I said before, so important, <clears throat> so timely. Um, we have, we've had an active chat and um, in our active comments in the chat. And we've had some, some help from my fellow librarians putting links to the articles you mentioned from the Arkansas Times to the Aftermath Project, which was done by Jay Barth and is part of the Butler Center. Um, so people can find those links in the chat. But before we get to some of the, the questions that, that folks have asked, um, I have a couple of my own questions. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, that comment early on in your talk about is it to downtown or through downtown? To me, that kind of can sum it up in a nutshell. I mean, because because you were, you know, you this crosstown freeway concept of you know not having to go through all those neighborhoods, not having to drive all the way down Markham um, or 12th Street and have to stop at lights, um, but but at the same time, you know, having you know not having to look at some of the areas that people don't necessarily want to be in, um, for good or bad. So um, I felt that was really powerful. Um, as a historian, I'm curious about what sources that you discovered that surprised you. Like you didn't, you know, oftentimes newspapers are great sources, but, you know, did you find articles in places that you, you know, you didn't expect or did something take you in a direction where you were like, oh my gosh, I had no idea that this, this resource existed over here. Absolutely. Um, I worked intimately with the Special Collections Department um, at the University of Arkansas Mullins Library. And one of the sources, some of the sources that I found that were um, most surprising early on were some of these relocation reports that indicated um, not only demographics about the individuals that were being relocated, but also how prominently the goals of urban renewal were touted and using racialized language and statistics. Um, the fact that these relocation reports would uh, chronicle things down to sexually transmitted disease rates, like those type of statistics and racialized uh, all of this information, those type of statistics were something that I had never encountered before in, in, in publications and in, uh, urban progress publications. And these were touted these were these relocation reports were publicized by all types of groups like metro plan the little rock housing authority uh the chambers of commerce all of these various uh, municipal organizations that would utilize imagery and racialized statistics to show how urban renewal was helping black communities and so to read that and then to come from where i come from in little rock and understand the impact that uh that these communities, what everyday life was like in these communities, it's almost like it became clear that the goals of these publications were to really uh, put a best foot forward for the progress efforts in Little Rock, to really celebrate um, this effort towards progress and overview the actual impact that many of these dislocated communities were experiencing. So that was a, that was a really, really revealing part of the, of the process in early source material. So, you know, those, those, I think I've often heard them referred to, and I apologize if this is wrong, these blight studies, you know, they, they talked about these sections. I know West Rock was used as a, an area that was considered a slum or blight. You know, they identified these sections as supposedly a way to, you know, they were going to clean out the blight and make this path through town. Were any of those sections that you know of white sections? 
I mean, or was it exclusively African American? So, Little Rock itself was majorly a was majorly a peppered community. So you had mm -hmm. areas in urban Little Rock where black and white people resided in close proximity. Um, some of the early targetings for the routes for I six thirty um, were in the western section of Little Rock. So as the project itself was developing, um, there were moments where choices were made about which places to select the routes for the for the inner city portion of the freeway project itself. And so during this time period, you saw more targeting of some of these um, traditional neighborhoods, uh, the Dunbar communities, and even before mm -hmm. Interstate 630 was constructed, um, urban renewal practices were relocating many of these neighborhoods um, before uh, Interstate 630 construction began. So this process was a long standing effort um, throughout the middle of the 20th century. And it was consolidated and, and really, uh, really, con really just concrete, placed in concrete by, by 630. Uh, yeah. And I think it's important um, to point out that, you know, African Americans didn't have a role in these decisions. You know, they weren't, they weren't part of the city government structure. They weren't part of the board of directors. You know, they weren't part of this decision making process. And, um, you know, so I think, I think it's important to state that. Um, I think we've had a couple of questions and comments about, you know, why didn't more African Americans speak up about it? Um, I've been reading and then those also, in, the, in, the, in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> and then also before we get to, and then we'll get to, I promise we'll get to questions, folks. I want to address Mount Holly because I think the Mount Holly Cemetery I often hear it's, you know, well, they had to get around Mount Holly. You can't move a cemetery. Well, you can move a cemetery. Um, it's complicated, but you can move a cemetery. Um, and I think Mount Holly is a perfect example of, you know, dodging this very significant white landmark um, and getting rid of some, you know, because right across the street from Mount Holly is Mosaic Templars. Right. You know, so so back to, you know, the idea of this this Little Rock is a peppered community. I mean, we're we used to say I used to work at the Central High National Historic Site and then I worked at Mosaic Templars. But we used to say that Little Rock is more segregated now in many ways than it was in 57 because of that that kind of peppered. I mean, block by block and, you know, sections of town. And so you've got Mount Holly, you know, there on the, the south side of the interstate now. And then you've got my Mosaic Templars, you know, literally directly across from it. So, um, so do you wanna, you wanna say any more? <laughs> I've kind of taken away well, the platform. No, Sorry, no, Eric. I, no, I, I, it's, it's totally fine because um, you're making an important point. You're emphasizing an important aspect in, in that certain areas were saved from this process, um, Mount Holly Cemetery, um, but, it's important to realize what areas were also saved, especially in these publications that um, touted that these urban renewal practices would save Little Rock's history. And so when you look at the preservation of locations like Albert Pike Settler Home, Albert Pike was a key component to white supremacy in Arkansas. And so preservation of his history was prioritized over the preservation of these longstanding Black communities. And that was intentional. That was a part of selectively maintaining portions of Little Rock's history to the, to the goals of, of white supremacy. So I think that the point that you are making about which areas were targeted and which areas were saved is a key aspect to reveal how all of these things are racialized. Yeah. And when, when African-Americans aren't part of the narrative, when they're not in the meetings, when they're not in the discussions, um, you know, white folks just aren't going to know that that was supposed to be there. I, okay, so let's get to people's questions. Um, Mary Evans would like to know what year the photograph of the freeway in the first slide was, and that's the one with the section right, right. around Woodrow Street, right? I have to, let me pull that up and see if I can. It's from a newspaper article in the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. So all of those Images are publicly available and uh, the Arkansas mm -hmm. Democrat Gazette archives. I have to go back and pull it up to see exactly what year it came from, but it did come from the Arkansas Democrat Gazette archives. Okay. 
it looks like, I mean, the Woodrow Street section was done um, in the, I think the late seventies. So that kind of looks like it's, it's that late seventies time period. So, um, and let's see. I saw okay. going about alternate route selections. Well, let's talk about that one. Okay. Let me, let me find it. We have a lot of, we have a lot of questions and comments. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, Real quick while I'm looking for that, Joe Hudak would like to know what was the first book you mentioned before White Flight and Modern Freeway Studies? Uh, probably uh, A World More Concrete by Nate Connolly. And it talks about real estate interest and the remaking of Jim Crow South Florida. Um, and so Nate Connolly published A World More Concrete. Kevin Cruz published uh, White Flight and it talks about um, uh, uh, white flight in Atlanta, and um, the 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 with the Julius book. Uh, let me see the William Julius Wilson's uh, book, the Truly Disadvantaged. All of these are important uh, pieces of scholarship when it comes to urban development policy. So here here's maybe the one you were seeing. Um, was there any thought given to building an overpass to keep? Ninth connected on both sides of 630, 9th Street, I guess 9th Street connected on both sides of 630. I recognize the lack of political power by African American, highly probable, high probability resulted in the decision. Yes, I definitely want to address that. So, um, in the environmental, the reason I disclosed the environmental impact statement is because I want people to go back and look at it. I want people to go, because it's public record, I want people to go back and look it up. Um, in the environmental impact statement, there are multiple alternative route selections presented. Um, any uh, infrastructural project like an interstate has to have alternative plans in its environmental impact statement uh, including the, the alternative to do nothing, to absolutely not do the project at all because of the, the federal requirements. And so in the environmental impact statement, you can see multiple um, alternative route selections presented, both by the community and by other um, planners as well. And these alternate route selections were explained away. These alternate route selections would have ultimately saved the project money. It would have saved the project time. It would have saved um, some of the, the, the destruction of some of these areas, these longstanding black communities. However, when presented with these alternatives, the, the, the power systems, including the highway and department of transportation decided to go with the routes that were indicated um, where the freeway currently is constructed. And those were intentional decisions made with more information available. They were, they were presented with alternative route selections and they still chose to persist to place the routes where they were. And again, that's why I made the statement that persistence was, uh, this persistence was key, was a red flag for me to understand. And okay, um, even when presented with other alternatives, these specific selections were still chosen. And I wanted to make one more comment on the question about um, community opposition. So black people resisted Interstate 630's construction from early on, and especially as it developed in the 1970s and in the 1980s, the community pushed back from people like Annie Abrams, um, from other community leaders. These individuals were a part of the voice of the community to try to address some of the grievances in any capacity that they could because they did not have access to decision-making power. They did not have access to um, these individuals who were uh, the money representatives of the power in Little Rock. And so the, the community pushback came in the form of community forums. It came in, it came in um, op-eds and newspapers. And it also came in community organizing against, these, uh, against the onset of these, um, the freeway project itself. And this was reflected in cities across the country. There was a freeway, the entire freeway revolt in which um, you saw this same activity occurring in places across the country where communities were recognizing the impact that interstates were having and dividing their cities. Well, and urban renewal was just, I mean, as a historian, urban renewal was just bad all the way around. I mean, there are so many places in Little Rock um, that were demolished, you know, 
from a historic preservation standpoint, it's, it was just a nightmare. Like it was a bad, <laughs> it was a bad program. Um, and, and then, you know, what happened with the interstate was even, you know, worse. So um, I've got a question here. Um, this person, this gen I think it's a gentleman asks, I'm curious if you know of any promising proposed solutions for reshaping these, inter these freeways going forward to start healing the racial violence they inflicted. I mean, is this, you know, interstates are steam, still being built. I mean, is, this Absolutely. is still happening, right? Absolutely. This isn't gone away. So that's a great question. And in my research, I've talked to uh, the mayor of the city, Frank Scott, uh, the city manager, Bruce Moore, and I've asked them these specific questions in addition to the historians that I've talked to. I asked them about the, the continued concern of interstate construction in Little Rock and, and interstate expansion in Little Rock. And the new interstate project in uh, 30, I believe, in the eastern part of, of Little Rock, the city manager, Bruce Moore, indicated that this, these new construction projects were built with the lessons of I-630 in mind. So first of all, they're not as in uh, targeting heavily residential communities like Interstate 630 did. And the, all of the information and the years of learning and the years of controversy and pushback after Interstate 630 really shaped what the, the future of interstate construction will look like in Little Rock going forward. All of the practices that um, have been um, really just, all of the negative practices that have been articulated by the communities have gone into the future decision-making for construction going forward. Now that's from the city manager, Bruce Moore, and that's from uh, Mayor Frank mm -hmm. Scott. But of course, the, the continued freeway construction in Little Rock is an ongoing issue and, and I foresee it continuing to be. So we have a question here um, and the person asked, did I understand that we're maintaining that I, it says she, but I don't know if it was a mistype, um, maintains that urban renewal was a white supremacist strategy. And I would say, yes. I mean, I think it's, it's fairly clear when you look at the, the reports, when you look at the relocation reports, when you look at the neighborhood analysis studies, when you look at all of the data around urban renewal and relocation and the demographics of individuals that were targeted and not only the demographics of individuals that were targeted, but the language used to describe these individuals is highly indicative of the relationship between urban renewal and white supremacy. When you look at the description of black and brown communities as blight, as urban decay, as, mm -hmm. um, solution, as problems that require solutions of eminent domain, all of these things mm -hmm. indicate a, a relationship between race and, and urban development policy during urban renewal. And I was going to add one of the questions I had written down earlier was, you know, the land was it eminent domain. Is that how they took the land or was, were people compensated? I mean, usually in that situation, they're not compensated for the fair market value of it. Absolutely. That's the key, the fair market compensation. So there would be some compensation for these relocation efforts, but it, as I uh, stated before, it was nowhere near the amount of compensation needed to secure long-term placements. Um, mm -hmm. It was nowhere near the, the fair market value for um, what will ultimately become the, the, the destruction of these former uh, Black communities and what we see now, the renovation of these communities under gentrified cir circumstances, mm -hmm. where, the, where the property values are far higher than they were um, during, that, during that time period. And there's a couple of questions and some, I think some people also answered this in the chat, but about, you know, black newspapers in Little Rock at the time. So there's the Arkansas State Press, which is right. run by LC and Daisy Bates, right. um, or is published by LC and Daisy Bates. And it says, how did they cover freeway construction and urban renewal? So what was the, what was state press saying about it? Um, the state press, I believe, had gone defunct um, right immediately after uh, That's the right. desegregation of Little Rock Central High School as one of the um, unfortunate consequences of Miss Bates' efforts and, and really the Bates family. It wasn't just Daisy Bates. It's the consequences of the Bates family's effort. Um, their newspaper endeavor was was basically blackballed out of existence. Yeah. And so there wasn't so, another African American. There were other African American newspapers. I mean, we, I know we got um, a lot of folks got a paper out of Chicago, and there was the Philadelphia. I 
can't remember, there was a Philadelphia paper that I know a lot of African-American households took, as well as Jet and Ebony magazines, um, you know, published by Joe Johnson, but um, mm -hmm. it is Joe Johnson, right? Not John Johnson. <laughs> I, just, uh, I just had one of those moments in my brain where... <laughs> I know who you're referring to. It's, it's okay. <laughs> He's from Arkansas City. He went to Chicago. I'll look in the Encyclopedia of Arkansas later and correct myself. Okay, let me make sure, let me get down to these. We've had some new comments. Yeah, these are some great questions. Uh, Mark Chris would like to know: Will you publish your dissertation? Absolutely. Um, I plan to publish uh, my dissertation project in various. Um, various phases. So this will be the introduction. What I read for you all today will be uh, sort of the introduction for my dissertation project. But as I continue um, to, to push it out for publication, I'm going to expand that, uh, each of these chapters into publishable articles as well. So I'll be publishing a lot of this um, in the next 12 to, to 24 months as I'm graduating and moving forward in an academic progress, a process. Um, so Kwame, a friend of ours who's posted for Clarice says, um, or asked the question, it's probably more rhetorical, but um, even if, you know, people of color, individuals of color are on boards, do they really have the power to stop a machine? And yes, I mean, no, they don't have the power. Just, yes, Clarice, yes. I mean, that's such a perfect statement. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, mean, I would definitely just concur with that sentiment. Like, you know, the the goals for I C thirty and for urban renewal were long standing. Like th these weren't new developments, and and the relationship to white supremacy is even longer standing than those modern urban goals. And so, black individuals or people of color who were who would have been in position to uh, to speak out against this type of injustices, they did so, but their voice would not have mattered when it comes to ultimately the execution of these projects. Uh, John Walker is an important name that comes to mind when uh, when it comes to organizing work against Interstate 630 and organizing these community efforts, especially the black community's efforts um, to resist Interstate 630's construction. And these are prominent people in Little Rock. Um, when you look at Miss Annie Abrams, she was one of the first uh, African Americans on the Central High School uh, Parent Teacher Association. These are prominent voices in Little Rock, and yet even with this push behind the resistance, it still is ultimately a futile effort. Well, and someone says, um, as someone from another state, you can physically see the difference between one side of the bridge and the other. Um, literally, it goes from Starbucks to dilapidated structures. Um, I mean, and, and you commented, or you and I were chatting yesterday, and, you know, you grew up right across from Way Winter, Ray Winter Field. I've always had trouble with that. Um, you grew up right across the street there, uh, right across the interstate. And so you, you know, you have experienced, talk a little bit about that. Talk a little bit I about will. growing up on the freeway. This, that's ultimately what shaped um, my research is my experience growing up. Um, off of 12th Street on Jefferson Street, right next to Interstate 630. And one of the, the, the earliest recollections I have about this, this duality, this dual existence in Little Rock was um, I used to do work for uh, Tracy Steele when he was the executive director for the Arkansas Martin Luther King Commission, and it was right down from the state capitol. Um, and where I lived was, of course, across I-630 from the capitol complex. And so I would go and do work over at the state capitol um, when I was 12, 13, 14 years old. And then I would leave there. I would be around all of these individuals with power, all of these legislators, all of these people, you know, running errands and doing my business for the Arkansas Martin Luther King Commission. And then I would leave and go home and be in a different world. I would leave and go home and where I lived looked nothing like the places where I went during the daytime, where I worked, where uh, even if you just skip over to uh, North Little Rock, or if you just skip over to the north side of the freeway, it's an entirely different existence. And that's why I shared the um, that's why I shared the Opportunity Atlas study 
and the trace.org gun violence study with you all because I want you to go to these resources and I want you to put in Little Rock's zip code and I want you to physically see the demarcation of all of these socioeconomic factors, poverty rates, uh, incarceration rates, single parent homes, um, low education, all of these factors are contained. High gun violence at the street level are contained by Interstate 630. And so it puts to it puts some data behind what we understand as our lived experience. When you grow up in one of these communities, you know it's a difference. You feel the difference. Your schools are different. Where, where, your gross, where you get groceries are different. Every aspect of your life is totally different than just on the other side of the freeway. And so once you begin to actually see the data behind it, it becomes undeniable. Well, and somebody asks, and this is a good question, you know, what happened to the businesses on Ninth Street? And many of them closed. Many of them couldn't make the move, couldn't relocate. There were a lot of people, um, I know a lot of times when when people talk about Ninth Street and they talk about the 630, um, you know, push through, they talk, they also talk about University Heights and the fact that the, the houses in University Heights were built and, and sold to folks who were relocated. And oftentimes they couldn't afford, in the end, they couldn't afford the house. It was, it was more than they could afford. And do, did you look at any of that? Um, that was indicated in some of those relocation reports where they would show um, the, 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 numbers for the cost for the housing where these people would be relocated and it doesn't take much to understand that if these people were living in slum dwellings beforehand um, the relocation was not going to be a successful venture due to the ex increased expenses at these uh, new standardized housing locations um, and I also wanted to say uh, man you brought up a great point that I wanted to respond to about um, the 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 relocation itself it'll come back to me but I'm sorry okay I, we're gonna go if it's okay with you we're gonna go a little long because we've got a oh, lot yeah, more I'm, questions I'm yeah, to ask and and I'm cool with that if you're good okay um Absolutely. let's see someone asks are the maps of what was on, was okay let me try that again are the maps are there maps of what was on Ninth Street before 630 was built yes I can answer that one um is there a record of all the houses and businesses that were there? I hear it was a bustling community and I'm curious of what all it contained. I highly recommend that you visit the Mosaic Templars Cultural Center. Um, they have exhibits about Ninth Street. Also, you can, you, I'm gonna, I promise Eric, I'm gonna let you answer your question, but um, you can also go to, at the, at the Central Arkansas Library System, we have a fire insurance map collection that's digital, it's a database. This is one of my favorite databases we have um, because you can look at what was, it, their maps, made for fire insurance so you can see what the building was supposed to I mean what the building looked like whether it was a brick structure you know um they're great it's a great resource so it is okay, absolutely. Now I'll let you fire I'll insurance you. maps are some of the best resources for understanding mm -hmm. the old uh infrastructure in Little Rock and then I would also offer uh just for more context uh Bernard J Love's um a chronicle on West 9th Street um she really did an amazing job of kind of bringing the the details of everyday life in in that section of Little Rock and Black Little Rock to life um, as it was before it, it was um, destroyed by I-630. And that's, that brings, I remember what I was going to say now. Okay. It's very important to understand that Interstate 630 did not, was not the sole um, cause for the destruction of West 9th Street. West 9th Street and some of these Black communities were already in decline as Interstate 630 was coming into fruition. And the construction of Interstate 630 itself finalized the end of many of these communities that were already beginning to decline. Well, and thank you to the four or five people who corrected me. It is John H. Johnson, um, who published Jet and Ebony Magazine. As it was coming out of my mouth, I knew I was saying, I knew I was using the wrong name and it was coming before I knew. Um, and often the fire insurance maps, you'll hear people refer the, to them as Sanborn maps, which is one of yep. the many companies. So if you hear Sanborn or fire insurance, there's a great collection of the Library of Congress as well. Eric and I are both big fans of fire insurance maps. <laughs> I, um, love them. I love them. <laughs> they are. They're great. They're great. Um, let's see. 
Um, so Steve Strauss would like to know if you have any thoughts on why African-Americans in Little Rock or African-American Little Rock residents didn't choose to live north of 630. Well, um, that's a very complicated answer, but there are numerous factors outlining um, why African-Americans did not live in many of these communities north of I-630. Exclusionary housing practices, primarily, um, but then also uh, the inaccessibility or the inability to afford some of these um, locations was a primary prohibitive, prohibitive uh, factor as well. But the, the, the main issue from my understanding, and, and of course, further research can, uh, can piece out more uh, factors, but these exclusionary uh, housing practices, redlining, all of these other uh, practices mm -hmm. occurred in Little Rock and excluded African-Americans from the ability to live in some of these, some of these uh, areas north of 630, north and west of 630. So I know that the highway department was, I mean, it's obviously a highway department project, 630, um, and it's a federal project, but I mean, this, how did the city board um, and city leaders influence decisions? I mean, what kind of, what kind of discussions went on, you know, did, did the highway department just come and say, okay, this is where we're going to lay it down so all of these details were worked out through negotiations between various philanthropic real estate and business interests with the local city government. Um, and that's why figures like George Miller were key in this process because they, uh, people like George Miller uh, would bring together various aspects of the, the, the business and real estate and economic interest in Little Rock. Um, being the president of the Little Rock Housing Authority and then ultimately being recruited by uh, philanthropic groups like 50 for the Future, um, George Miller became um, a key decision maker in moving the Interstate 630 project to the next level. Um, its original conceptions uh, were, were phased out early on um, during the construction of, of the East West Expressway due to a lack of resource and, and a lack of funding. And so to spearhead the momentum forward you saw local interest, local uh, philanthropic interest, local governing interest identify people like George Miller to try to target Wilbur D. Mills to incorporate it into the federal interstate program. And so that's how some of those uh, decisions were made. Of course, I don't have the exact details on every decision that was made and, and the concept, the conversations that went into it, but you can see based on the, the, the record of lobbying and based on the record of communication between these different organizations, whether it was the Housing Authority, the Chamber of Commerce, um, the 50 for the Future, the Urban Progress Association, mm -hmm. Metro Plan, all of these groups were in communication with each other to achieve uh, similar objectives. Well, this was great. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, there are tons. So all of my libra librarian and historian friends have helped us by sharing tons of links in the I chat. I see that. I'm thankful for um, that. It makes yeah, my job I know. easier. <laughs> I mean, you know, they they show up at these events for us and then they they actually do a job. So I really appreciate. Thank you. Thank you, friends, for doing this for us. Um, so what I'll do is we'll take all of those and compile them and make um, a list or a bibliography that people can access so that you can, you know, so that the, the folks can find the books like Berna Love's book, um, which is, you're right, it's fabulous. Um, and, and The Color of Law. I mean, just all of these books that are so important, um, you're getting rave reviews um, are coming up through the chat. So thank you so much for doing this. Um, like I said, I was I was so excited about this program when we talked a while back because I just felt like it was so important and so timely and there's a lot of misconceptions about what went on um, for the construction of 630. Um, I know a lot of white folks, including myself for a long time, didn't understand some of the, the you know, intended racial um, racism that went on in in the construction of this and again like you said it didn't happen just in arkansas and in little rock it happened all over the country um Absolutely. so i'm trying to find my notes for my closing which i've got so many windows open um next month 
<laughs> next month's <laughs> legacies and lunch is I'm going to try to do it from memory is Jody Barnes and she's going to talk about archaeology and gender um, at Mount at not Mount Holly at Hollywood Plantation um, in Southeast Arkansas and so that should be really a great we're, we're going to do Women's History Month and Archaeology Month in one presentation by Jody so that will be great and um, please take a moment to um, to fill out the survey that you're probably going to get tomorrow. It helps us at the library know if you're if you like what we're doing. Um, and by the numbers we got today, I think you like what we're doing. But but we like to know that. Um, I like to be able to show that to our bosses and say, look, they really did like us. So um, please fill out your survey tomorrow, and um, hopefully we'll see everybody here Monday night for um, Rage, Race, and Resistance with Richard Buckaloo. I don't know where it's all coming out of my brain. Um, and so that'll be at 6.30 Monday night and then Legacies and Lunch on March 3rd. So thank you again, Eric. This was fabulous. Really appreciate it. And um, everybody have a good day. Thank you. I have a great day.